The Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded in 1976 by 13 women leaders who wanted to be included in the community conversation. I am Sally Bloomfield and I was one of those 13 women. Having been left out of men's clubs that focused on community issues, it was a priority for us to make the club 100% inclusive. Today, CMC presents public policy forums every Wednesday at lunch with average attendance of more than 200 people. I'm Tony Bell and I frequently attend forums which are open to everyone and present relevant, current and newsworthy topics. I'm grateful that CMC is nonpartisan and presents many perspectives on every topic. I'm Jane Scott, President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. CMC is open to everyone. We invite you to explore the personal and professional benefits awaiting you at the Metropolitan Club. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. I'm Kelly Atkinson, the newly elected chair of the CMC Board of Trustees, and I'm also the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director and Columbus Office Administrator at Barnes & Thornburg. It's my pleasure to welcome our in-person audience today. Thank you to today's forum sponsor, the Columbus Foundation. Today's CMC live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. Thank you all. We all remember where we were on September 11, 2001, and probably find it difficult to believe that it was 20 years ago this month. For many of us, it started as an especially beautiful Fall Tuesday. But it was a day that would forever change the course of both American and Canadian history, as we will hear today. Today's panelists and our moderator were in places we heard about on the news, New York, the Pentagon, and stranded on a plane outside the US. Before we hear from our distinguished panel, it is CMC's honor to invite Angela Parsons, Vice President for Donor Services from today's forum sponsor, the Columbus Foundation, to the podium to introduce our speakers. Angela, the podium is yours. Thanks, Kelly. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here today representing your local community foundation. We're excited to once again be a sponsor of the Columbus Metropolitan Club as they connect people and ideas through community conversations. As Kelly mentioned, I clearly remember being in a small fishing village in Canada, Peggy's Cove, when I learned about the terrorist attacks. I did not know at that time that seven years later, I would come to work at the Columbus Foundation and had the honor of working with a very special woman, one of my role models, um, on a fund that supports another small fishing village in Canada. One that stepped up in a time of need and selflessly supported others. The Lewisport Area Flight 15 Scholarship Fund. This is just one of the stories you're gonna hear today. So it's my, it's my pleasure to introduce today's forum speakers. Shirley Brooks Jones, Delta Flight 15 passenger, Scott Light, journalist and owner, Scott Light Consulting, and our host, Jerry Revish, retired television news co-anchor of WBNS 10 TV. Jerry, we look forward to today's conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for being with us today. September 11, 2001 remains the single deadliest terrorist attack on American soil. And the numbers 20 years later are still pretty mind-boggling. 2,996 people were killed that day, including the 19 terrorist hijackers aboard the four airplanes. At the World Trade Center, 2,763 people died after the two planes slammed into the Twin Towers. That figure includes 343 firefighters and paramedics, 23 New York City police officers, and 37 Port Authority police. And there are 1,106 victims whose remains have still not been identified. 
That's about 40% of the death toll at ground zero. DNA testing continues to this day on fragments recovered from the area in hopes of finding possible matches. At the Pentagon, 189 people were killed, including 64 on American Airlines Flight 77. That airliner struck the Pentagon. On United Flight 93, 40 passengers and crew died when that plane crashed near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And today, with the help of Scott Light and Shirley Brooks Jones, we're going to offer our personal accounts on where we were that day and what we did. Scott, my dear friend and former co-anchor of Attend TV, covered the tragedy at the Pentagon, and Shirley was on one of the planes that landed in Gander, Newfoundland, after all air travel was grounded or diverted across North America that day. Her story is the impetus behind the Broadway show, Come From Away. And after watching those towers collapse from the Ten TV newsroom, I, along with a photographer, jumped into a news car and drove more than nine hours to get to New York City, where we spent the next four days reporting on that disaster. So Scott, let's start with you. Where were you that day, and what were you doing? I was working for the ABC station in Raleigh, North Carolina, and my job at that point was, uh, my work week went Wednesday through Sunday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I was out in the field as a reporter, news anchor, and then I anchored our 6 and 11 p.m. newscasts on Saturday and Sunday. So, um, and Jerry, as you well know, when you, you know, you get home after an 11 o'clock newscast, it's, it's after midnight. And I, I say that because on Tuesday, on September 11th, that was my day off. So I was up at about 8, 8.30 in the morning, but really groggy still. And, and I honestly wasn't, wasn't watching the news. Um, but, but I characterize the day as it, it started for me with Sesame Street and then ended at the Pentagon in this sense. That morning, 8.30, 9 o'clock, my wife is upstairs with our older son, then a toddler, watching Sesame Street. And the second plane hits the Twin Towers. And Julie, I could hear her voice from upstairs, and she said, are you watching TV? And I said, no. And she said, turn it on. And so at that point, I, I, I mean, you were all trying to take it in. And so I just immediately went upstairs, circled, came through the bedroom, and she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm taking a shower and going into work. And so it, it, I, I can still remember that moment of, of just turning the corner in the bedroom, the TV is on, and there's, you know, my toddler son and my wife. And, it, you know, it just it shakes you to your core. Um, showered, and by that point, uh, 9.37, that's when Flight 77, 9.37 in the morning, that's when Flight 77 hit the Pentagon. So just a few minutes after that, the station called, and they said, stay where you are, don't come in. We're going to have a photographer pick you up from your house. You're heading to D.C. Pack a bag, have no idea how long you're staying, but pack a lot of clothes. And I had already started packing, so... Um, but from Raleigh to North Carolina, it's a straight shot, four hours. And then the indelible mark for me was the first picture in my mind once we got there, going up 395, seeing the, the, the very symbol of our military might, the very symbol of our worldwide influence charred. And so we got up there just after lunchtime, and th the flames were out, but the Pentagon was still smoking. Never forget it, as long yeah. as I live. Shirley, where were you on that day? What were you doing? Well, I had been in meetings in Denmark and uh, had stopped in Frankfurt, Germany, just overnight to visit with uh, the granddaughter of one of my good friends. So get on the airplane at the airport in, in Frankfurt, Germany. We were about four and a half, five hours out from Frankfurt, Germany, over the North Atlantic. The captain came on the PA system and said, ladies and gentlemen, we have a slight mechanical problem. 
we have, it was a problem with an indicator light or something in the plane. And <coughs> he said, um, excuse me, <coughs> he said, just sit back and relax. He said, we're going to have to put down in Gander, Newfoundland and take a look. He said, by the way, we're too, we, we, we're too heavy to land at Gander, so we're going to have to drop 30,000 pounds of fuel. And I'm thinking, how many gallons is that? I figured it had to be a whole bunch, otherwise. <laughs> so we circled and circled, and uh, we finally came in for the landing in Gander. And so we sat, well, once we got parked, the captain then said, um, I have an apology to make. Uh, it, I, I, this is a, uh, what I said was a ruse. Actually, the equipment is fine. However, there's a national emergency in the United States. All the borders are closed, and the airspace is now under control of the military. Well, you know, as Scott was kind of groggy, I was too because I was really tired and I had been kind of taking a little nap, and I thought, what? And so then he told us that one of the Twin Towers had been hit by an airplane. Well, I grew up during the Second World War, and I remembered an air, or a, a, a military plane going into the Empire State Building. And that was the thought that went through my head. And I'm thinking, but why would they close the borders? Then he told us that the second tower had been hit. He told us that the Pentagon had been hit, and something had happened outside of Pittsburgh. And so he told us that he would get as much information to us as he could. What he did, we sat aboard our plane for 28 and a half hours on the tarmac in Gander, Newfoundland. What Captain Sweeney did, and I've told a lot of people, he was one of my true heroes during that period of time because he kept us ad advised of all kinds of information. He monitored the BBC the whole time we were aboard that plane and gave us the information. Now, I did something I'd never done before. I pulled my notebook out of my flight bag, and from the moment he told us we were going to put down in Gander, because I can't stand not to be busy, I, I had my notebook, and I figured if I'm going to have to sit in an airport for a while, I'm going to have my notebook with me. So I started writing down, every time Captain Sweeney told us something, I would write down what he told us I, and also the reaction of my fellow passengers. Um, I put down the time that he told us these things. Well, I had no idea what the time was because I was on Frankfurt time. Um, anybody know what the time zone is in Newfoundland? It's an hour and a half ahead of Eastern Standard Time. And those Newfoundlanders love it because they are different. So. <laughs> But we sat aboard that plane for 28 and a half hours, and then we finally were allowed off the planes. Now, the school bus drivers in the central Newfoundland area had been on strike. And when they found out what had happened, they came from all the little teeny tiny towns around to the airport in Gander and waited because they knew they were going to be needed. Now, during the time that we spent on that plane, the, the mayors of the, of the towns, uh, you know, of course the mayor of Gander, but all these other little tiny towns, and the ministers of the churches and the Salvation Army, those people all gathered together to figure out how many of the plain people, as they called us, each of those little communities could care for, and they went into action. You know, so once it came, once it got to the point where we were allowed off of the planes, um, they knew where we were all going to be. We were assigned not only to, to specific loca or, uh, communities, but to specific locations within those communities. So, um, you know, it, it, was, it was absolutely amazing. Um, the school bus driver that we had, uh, his name was uh, Mr. Moody. He, when we got on the bus, he put his hands on his hips and he said, me name's Moody, but that don't mean that's what I is. Well, you know, any tension was broken right then and there. Of course, we didn't have our luggage. We just had, you know, ourselves and our flight bag if we had one. We're driving out from the, out from the uh, airport, and somebody spotted a moose. And, the, and Mr. Moody looked in the rear view mirror, wants to see her, he said. Yeah, we wanted to see that moose. So he stopped the school bus, he put it in reverse, and all of us from cities were breaking our necks, you know, looking for the traffic. We were the only thing on the road. 
So he backed up to where the moose was. The moose stopped and you know, walked right on up closer to the bus and was looking at us. And we were looking at the moose. Pretty soon a second moose came along. <laughs> and, and so it was really, there were a lot of funny things that happened that broke tension, the, 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 you know, the fears that we had and all that sort of stuff. Finally, Mr. Moody looked in the rear view mirror. He said, you gots enough? Yeah, we had enough, so off down the road we went. And so we, get, we go, go into this little town of Lewisport, which is about 30 miles away from, from uh, Gander. And uh, we step off of the school bus. Now, I, I, some of you have heard this story, but stepped off of the school bus, and um, I looked up to where I had been assigned. I had been assigned to the Lewisport Lions Center. Now, as a kid, are any of you in here Lions? Members of Lions? Okay. When I was a kid, I was so nearsighted, I had to hold things clear up to my nose in order to see. I'm the oldest of nine kids. And the school nurse sent a note home and said, Shirley needs her eyes examined because she definitely needs glasses. Well, there wasn't any money for that. So the school nurse got in touch with the local Lions Club, and it was the Lions Club all those years ago that paid for that first eye examination and the first pair of glasses. And I've told many, many people, if it hadn't been for those anonymous, and they were all men at that point, I wouldn't be here sitting, talking with you about this incredible experience I had on 9-11. But I get off of that school bus, and I look up at where I had been assigned. I didn't know where I'd been assigned. It was the Lewisport Lions Center, and I lost it. I just truly lost it. Now, the other thing, <clears throat> the other thing that was absolutely tremendous to me, too, as we pulled into that little tiny town, Everywhere, on all the businesses and the homes, everywhere we looked, they were flying our stars and stripes. And, you know, I'll never forget that. And I'm thinking, where did these people get all of these American flags? I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. So they took care of us. They took care of us. I mean, I went into that Lions Center. There they had, the tables were all set up, white tablecloths, flowers on the table, the silverware. People were in the kitchen cooking. Up at the front of the, tea, of, of the little room was a little tiny TV. The screen was about that big. We dropped everything that we had, which wasn't much. I just had my purse and my flight bag. Dropped that stuff, went running up to that TV screen. We stood there for hours watching those pictures. And I've talked too long. You no, you're, you're fine. <laughs> you're fascinating storyteller. We, we appreciate that. You're, you're helping us out today. Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to come back to, to both of our uh, speakers here in, in a moment. Um, what you said there about people helping, I think we all can remember just the days that followed unity and, and strength of purpose and heart that people were exhibiting to uh, total strangers, no matter where you were. As I mentioned, I was in the newsroom that morning, and we're just standing there watching the monitors. In any TV station you go to, you're going to see everybody else on the, the wall there, the, your competition and the, all the other stations. Anyway, I couldn't believe my eyes. I, I saw the smoke rising off of this, uh, the first tower. That's when the network broke in. And then as I was standing there watching that, I saw that second plane hit. And I, I was still trying to comprehend all of this. I thought, is this just bad flying here by this pilot? or? Um, pilot error, uh, a terrorist attack never, never crossed my mind. Um, but the news director turned to me and said, Jerry, you need to go. Go home and grab some clothes, come back, we'll get a photographer for you, and you go to New York tonight. So I did that, I was back in about maybe 45 minutes or so, we climbed into one of the news cars and uh, with what clothes we had and drove. We drove for nine hours to get up to, uh, to New York City. Um, all the bridges and roads were closed when we got up there. On the way up, we were listening to the radio totally, just listening for every little piece of information that would uh, come. And at first, there wasn't a whole lot, but then things were, were, were being uh, transmitted to us, being relayed to the folks who were listening to the radio about what had happened here. So we got to town about 11 o'clock that night and didn't have time to set up for anything but a phoner. And as close as we could get was the Hudson River on the other side of Manhattan. But we could see this huge 
ball of smoke, uh, orange and black and white, different colors, just hanging over lower Manhattan there and just hanging in the air around all of that. And the air smelt like burnt wire. It was just that far away we could still smell uh, that. And uh, I remember the emergency rooms were waiting for a lot of patients to come in. Uh, but strangely enough, the destruction was so complete in those towers that there wasn't a crush of ambulances arriving at the hospitals that night with severely injured people. It was either people with minor injuries or dead people that were being transported. Very little in between. The, the, the hospitals were eerily quiet that night. And we're going to continue to pick up with uh, Scott now and Shirley. So Scott, you, you're there on the scene. You saw the, the fire had, had been out. You see all the smoke. Where did you go? What did you do? So Flight 77 hit on the west side of the Pentagon. And then we went basically across the interstate set up. There was a, a huge, it was just a makeshift temporary uh, media setup point. But that's where kind of everyone went. It was just a follow the herd kind of a thing. There was nothing official, you know, set up. Authorities were just, you know, they obviously had a perimeter around the Pentagon. But so we were um, across from the west side and, and just had, had that view. And we did what you mentioned, Jer. We, you know, you try to get set up as quickly as possible. I think we were having some technical difficulties. And I think my first live hit was a phoner as well, because again, everybody is trying to bring their live trucks and news cars. And it, it, was, it was just a crush to get there. I'll also never forget, you, you were talking, Shirley, about people taking care of you. The other folks who set up in that um, parking lot, um, it was the American Red Cross. And they fed us for days. And I, I remember going and getting a meal. And I just said, thank you guys so much for doing this. I was amazed at the supplies that they had ready to go, completely turnkey. They were feeding hundreds of us. And this one man just said, we're feeding you so you guys can get back out there and tell the story that the world needs to see and, and hear about. But again, it was just that, that coming together in a thousand plus ways of, of a more unified country after such a tragedy and everybody everybody pitching in and, and that, that went to, you know, again, people, you know, keeping the, you know, lowly members of the media fed just to keep us out there so we could continue to broadcast. Such an immense story and such an immense crime scene, uh, all three of them. Who did you start talking to, Scott, when you, when you first started getting to work there? The, when we went there, you know, the goal of, if you're thinking, well, why in the world would a Raleigh, North Carolina TV station go to, to D.C.? I mean, you, if, if you're in news, you know, you, you want to go where news is happening. And, and I, I don't mean that to sound crass, but I mean, that, and that's honestly when we're supposed to be our best, is when there is no teleprompter, when you are on the fly, and when you are relying on your experience and, and your know-how and your knowledge and your homework. And so you want to be there. Um, but we went and then specifically once we got there and kind of set the scene, that's when first responders from all over the country started coming in. And so then that's when we started finding people in North Carolina, people germane to, to our market. And so we were looking for just those folks. That, that was our first kind of on the ground search, so to speak, of people from North Carolina getting to that scene and we were telling their story, what they were doing, who they were helping. And again, it was, it was everyone from, from volunteers, American Red Cross, to men and women in, in myriad uniforms. So Shirley, where we, we stopped your story there, or where you stopped, uh, you, were in a, uh, you were being fed by uh, volunteers, and you were at this location throughout your stay there, um, in that room, or where were you? Uh, yes, there were four plane loads of people that were assigned to Lewisport. 
Now, Lewisport is surrounded by about 13 or 14 little tiny, tiny towns uh, that come into Lewisport for churches and the last three years of their schooling and everything else. Um, those people all came into Lewisport to help. We all were, we were assigned to churches and schools and service clubs all over the place. Um, in the Lions Club Center, for example, the, uh, the school kids brought in, brought in uh, the gym mats so we could sleep on the gym mats on the floor. Uh, the, the women cleared their homes of their blankets and pillows and, and um, you know, the towels and their washcloths. They brought uh, all kinds of toiletries. I mean, there was shaving cream and razors and shampoo, diapers for the kids. We had a lot of kids on our plane. Um, so everybody came from all over. And <clears throat> the mayor told me, you know, um, he said, I don't even know some of these people, but they came from all over, and they were working together like, like they were, you know, that they'd done this forever. And I said to the mayor, how do you get all of these things done? He said, I gets on the radio and I tells them what I needs. And they come in, you know, and it was, it was incredible. We had, we had a group of um, uh, students from India along with their professor. Two of those students were graduate students returning to Columbus. They were working on, one was working on her master's, the other a PhD, in my college of agriculture. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, yeah. There was also, um, there were also 10 uh, people from Ukraine who were, head, who were headed to Columbus. They were social workers. They were gonna be doing uh, work, you know, but they came in from all different areas. I mean, they cooked for us. They, they never slept. They never slept. It was just incredible. Um, I, uh, <laughs> anyway, lots of funny things. I, my sense of direction's always been terrible, and uh, during the night I had to get up to go to the bathroom, and, I, and they'd turned the lights down, and I wasn't sure whether the men's room was that way or the women's were that way, and it took me back to the first grade when I had to go to the bathroom, <clears throat> and the teacher let me go, and she said, you know where they are? Yeah, so I ended up in the boys' room. So I thought, well, you know, that's me. But all kinds of things. The fishermen would come in and say they were going to take their boats out. Would somebody like to go? I have a couple of really precious, precious memories, and many of you have heard me tell about this. Um, they had shut down the schools. They had shut down everything to take care of the plain people. I looked over in the corner of one of the, uh, and one of the high school girls was sitting on the floor reading to a whole bunch of little kids gathered around her. She's reading stories to these little kids. And what a precious thing. Another day, I looked over at the side door of the, of the club, and here came a little boy, he, just a tiny, tiny little fella. He had a stuffed animal under one arm, mm -hmm. and he's dragging his blanket in the other arm. He had brought those things in for, for the little kids. Oh. I mean, everybody, there was such kindness and love <clears throat> we didn't know each other, but boy, we fell in love with each other. We did. We did. Fell in love with each other. The, the commonality of that, that yes. tragedy brought a lot of different people yes. from a cross-section of humanity together during that time. We got a little closer in uh, as the, the morning came. Um, some of the access in was a little easier, so we got a little closer in. Uh, to where a ground zero was, but not really that close to it. People would come up to our news vehicle with photographs of their loved ones, and they would ask us if we would put them on TV because they were missing. You know, when you think about what had happened that morning, people went to work just like you and I went to work, and they never came home. And many of them, 40% of them, they still have no, no remains to, for closure on, on, on burial. We didn't have the heart to tell them that we, um, you, this won't be seen here in New York. It's going to be seen in Columbus. So we just shot the pictures anyway and, and interviewed them and, and heard their stories. For We figured we could use that at a later time. Some central Ohio firefighters had, uh, and other uh, emergency uh, responders had driven up <clears throat> also to uh, New York City, and they were there as well, and they were camped out at the Jacob Javits Convention Center um, at night for, you know, the end of their shift on the pile, as they called that 
uh, ground zero area where the towers collapsed. And all of that acrid smoke was still hanging over the air. Um, can you imagine all of the things that were crumbling when those towers went down? There was asbestos and all sorts of other toxic materials that was in that air. And a lot of these helpers that went to the pile didn't have proper, um, you know, masks or breathing apparatus. And some of them were down there without anything. They just wanted to help. And as you know, in the months that followed, uh, we found out that s many people uh, suffered from uh, breathing problems and, and cancer and all of that from being exposed to uh, the chemicals down there. The city was totally paralyzed, totally paralyzed. All of these people who were used to a, a round the clock experience, the great Gotham was totally helpless in that moment. And I was, I was amazed at how people were coming together to help. The, the restaurants uh, were pre preparing meals for all of the folks that were going down into the disaster area, just bringing all sorts of food. People from outside were bringing things in to try to help out where they could. Nurses were down there um, looking for wounded people, injured people, however they could help. It was just an amazing um, pulling together uh, of people uh, in a disaster that is still to this day hard to really get your hands around. Uh, Scott, how did, you, how did you navigate your emotions through all of that? I was nauseous, uh, seriously, for the whole, I think I was there eight days the first time. And just, you're just sick, you're, you, you are. And, and then you, you know, and then you have, you have to hit another gear of, okay, we, we have stories to tell. And we've got to go out and, and tell these stories. The other thing I think about, Jerry, you were talking about the Twin Towers. The other thing that we were trying to bring some perspective to was the Pentagon itself. Think about this building for just a little bit. Surely ask you guys a couple of questions. I'll ask this one. Does anyone happen to know the, the day of the groundbreaking for the Pentagon? September 11th. That's right. It was 9-11-1941. And so think about this building that's six million square feet. The building itself covers about 30 acres. The whole expanse is a, is a couple hundred. It was built in less than 16 months. And then remember in 41, you know, we were a nation, we were girding for war. So steel was going to the war effort. So what was the Pentagon largely built out of? It was concrete, thank goodness because that fortified concrete stood tall for the most part. The, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up just, just thinking about that. It, yes, Flight 77 penetrated three of the five rings of the Pentagon. But remember that from 937, the, the plane hits, there was about 30 minutes that went by before any of the upper floors of the Pentagon collapsed. I don't know if you remember, there was, a, there was another collapse at about 1015. Because of that structural rigidity and those concrete pillars, by the way, much of the sand and gravel came from the Potomac River to make that concrete back in 1941 and 42. Um, but those pillars, yes, it's several dozen that, that were completely destroyed. But they stood tall, and that time period from 9.37 a.m. to 10.15 enabled hundreds of people in those upper floors on the west side of the Pentagon to get out. And so I, I think of the engineering marvel. It, it really is. If you just think, think of the expanse that is the Pentagon, how it was built, and oh, one other footnote in history. It was the first desegregated building in the state of Virginia. And it was actually, when it was being built, there were th the thought was it was going to be segregated because they built 284 bathrooms, double the number that was needed, thinking that it would be segregated. Roosevelt said, nope. And he fought Virginia, Virginia, the state of Virginia eventually relented, but Roosevelt, Herbasher, correct me if I'm wrong, because you probably know this, 
but Roosevelt had signed an executive order actually the year before that said it w there will be no discrimination of federal employees. This is so rich, our conversation. We, we just don't have as much time as we need, but I surely I do want to get to this play that you are uh, uh, f charactered in. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, <laughs> let, let, could I just say one more thing about New York City? One really wonderful tie to New York City, Lewisport, and 9-11. On one of the planes from, from Milan, Italy to New York City had vice president and several board members of the Rockefeller Foundation. That was one of the planes that was assigned to Lewisport. They stayed in uh, one of the churches. When they got there, they said, we desperately need to find some computers. The minister said, of course, the schools were shut down. He said, I'll get the school open. I'll call some of the kids in to open the computer center. folks." The Rockefeller Foundation was run from the middle school in Lewisport, Newfoundland for about six days. And that, that, that I think is just really impressive. But back to the musical. About a minute. I need about, about a minute, minutes. a minute. Well, I, I tend to talk too much. I really, I'd never make it on the radio or TV. <laughs> but anyway, this couple named David Hine, uh, David Hine and Irene Seinkoff, they're Canadians, they decided that they would write a musical. They contacted me and I said, how in the world can you do a musical? They said, we're going to do it well. Uh, some of you have seen it. OK, it's called Come From Away. The reason it's called Come From Away <clears throat> is because those of us had come from away. Okay, now, my story is that I, I started the scholarship fund. As of this year, 341 kids from a little area that has fewer than 4,000 population have received that scholarship fund. One of the girls from the very first class has, she, she got two uh, um, uh, master's degrees, her medical degrees, just about two months ago. She was named chief of staff of her hospital. And to me, that is just so meaningful, so meaningful. But the musical... 30 <clears throat> 30 seconds. Okay, 30 seconds. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, the musical, the person who portrays me uh, on the North, North American tour is absolutely awesome. Awesome. It is James Earl Jones II. And he and I have met each other, and we're, we, we just have a great time together. The man who portrays me on the Broadway stage, likewise, he's a tall, handsome, young African-American. And the, the people have said, does that bother you? And I said, not in the least. You know, I'm proud of that. So anyway. And we're proud of you, and proud of you, Scott. <laughs> we thank you both for, uh, for giving us the insights that you have. We could just go on and on. Uh, we just have, don't have the, the luxury of time. It is a CMC long tradition to take audience questions, though. And Jane Scott of CMC is curating questions from the live stream audience. For our in-house audience, please join Jane at the microphone that you see there. We do ask that you keep your questions brief and to the point. However, before we take audience questions, we would like to invite a very special guest to the microphone. It is our great honor to welcome Canada's Council General to Ohio, Joe Comartin, to the microphone. Council General Comartin, welcome. Thanks, Jerry. I, I was going to pipe in at one point and say to Shirley, go ahead, use my time, because uh, I just love listening to her. Um, before I get to some of the comments I want to make about Shirley, um, I, I have a job, so I'm supposed to say certain things, and this is one of those times, but in particular, given the 20th anniversary, I couldn't help think back to where I was. I was a member of our federal parliament on that day, uh, just newly elected in a few months before. And um, I was at a sod turning ceremony uh, for a long-term care home along with the mayor of the city of Windsor, which is my home. And we both got the calls at the same time from our staff. We rushed back to our offices. And when I got back, he called me and said, Joe, I just got, I just got a call from Toronto, and they're asking if our airport can take planes uh, because the Toronto uh, International Airport was concerned of whether they were going to be able to take all of the ones that were being diverted to them. It turned out we didn't have to at the end result. The point I want to make about this is that so much as what you've heard from Shirley and, and see the experiences Jerry, you and Scott have had, th there was no question that we were going to do that. The only question was how do we prepare for it? 
How do we prepare for the people who are going to be coming off those planes? How do we deal with the security issues that might arise? We're right across from Detroit, are we a potential target? But there was never a hesitation, not one, in the mayor or the other people making that decision. We would take those planes because Canada and the United States are so much about a family. And Shirley, um, you're, you're the epitome of that. You're the, you're the human person that reflects that. Sure, you were treated extremely well by the people of Gander, by the people of Newfoundland. And you would have been treated the same way by people across Canada. The point, though, is what you did subsequent to that in terms of raising all those funds, getting all those, those uh, scholarships for students who probably would have not gotten that education given the area of the country that they lived in. That reci reciprocity between our two countries represents our relationship and has for a couple of hundred years now. And so you embody that. It's one that I'm here to say thank you for that. But I also want to say to you that if this had been the reverse, if it had been our planes landing in the United States, I expect your communities would have done exactly the same thing. And that's the great joy that we have of our country. And I suppose if there's anything good that's come out of 9-11, it's just built that relationship e e stronger and, and uh, made it even more solid than it has been. So I'm here today on behalf of the Canadian government to thank you for what you did uh, when you got back here, for all those funds that you raised, and for the person that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming today. Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, I do have some questions, and any of you who have questions in the audience, please get up here and um, we'll take turns asking questions. So um, I have known Shirley for 40 years, so I know sometimes you have to fill in the blanks. What this woman did when they got back, those 38 planes that were grounded in Gander, she was one of those planes, she got back on the plane, she talked somebody in, imagine this, she talked somebody in into using the microphone, and she began a scholarship fund for the children of Gander, and that's the story that we're telling about that she didn't get to the punchline quite, but um, those of us who have known Shirley for a long time, that was a given. She would do something kind like that. And this is, you're headed back to Gander this afternoon, or to, New, to support this afternoon, and what are you gonna do there? Yeah, as soon as I leave here, I head for Port Columbus. I'm heading back to, to Newfoundland. I've had a terrible time trying to make it, but I've got, all, I had all my shots, my tests, my everything. I had more problems with Air Canada, though, than <laughs> anything else. But, but I, and I also have a, a, a more than an 11-hour layover in Halifax before I can get on the plane to, to Gander, and then my friends will meet me there. So this will make my 30th trip back. And uh, I, 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 love, I love Canada, and Gander is my, or Newfoundland is my second home, that's for sure. Is this a scholarship award program tonight, or today? No, uh, the, the scholarship, the last two years, I had to be virtual because of the pandemic. So we, we presented the scholarships virtually, and uh, that's a different experience. I like looking at the kids in their eyes and talking with their parents, but yeah. So. Well, this will, so be, this will be, uh, I'll be, I'll be spending some time with David Hine and Irene Sankoff there. They're going to have a screening of, of, uh, of Come From Away, and there's a whole lot of, there, there's going to be a book launch. A new book is coming out called Flown from the Arms of, uh, Flown into the Arms of Angels. There's going to, I'm having uh, dinner with some uh, representatives of the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa and the Consul General in Halifax. So I'm going to be tired, and I didn't go to, <laughs> I, I didn't go to bed until 5.30 this morning because I was trying to get ready, so thank you. Uh, well, just so that Jerry and Scott get to uh, talk a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm curious, as professional journalists, was there a personal, emotional, defining moment that you just stopped in your tracks and you said, Scott, go ahead. I was going to say that it shows you how life is so precious and that you, you need to care about everybody that cares about you and even those that don't. What am I trying to say? There were people who, who kissed their wives and their kids 
uh, that morning and never came home. Um, there were some marriages that were on the rocks and they never got a chance to get that right. So you just don't want to have those things in your life. You just want to live a f uh, as full, uh, as peaceable, as loving a life as you can and to give back because you just don't know. None of those people knew that that was going to be their last day. So that's what I take away. I remember the wife of um, the pilot of Flight 93, she said, um, talking about Shanksville, in fact, she even said this, I think, publicly at one of the ceremonies. She said, if we've learned nothing else from this tragedy, life is short and there's no time for hate. And I think about that quote, and then I also think, I, I mentioned when, when we first got to the Pentagon, I, I'll just never forget the hulk of that building still um, smoking. But then I think we also remember, I think collectively, uh, probably the, everyone in this room also remembers when that giant American flag was unfurled from the top of the west side, right there in between what's called wedge one and wedge two of the west side of the, the Pentagon. Never forget it. Hi, Mimi Dane. Shirley, a quick question, two quick questions for you. Number one, how can we all support the scholarship fund? And number two, what else would you like to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the scholarship fund is set up at the Columbus Foundation. Uh, you can go online and um, uh, make contributions and every penny goes to scholarships, there's not one, and, and you know, all these trips that I take back, I pay for those myself. I don't take any money from that scholarship fund. I do it because I love those people and what they did for all of, all of us, so uh, yeah. Um, I have lots more to say. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think Jerry's gonna <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's a minister. just needed to get us to this he, portion of the program. He's, Jer <laughs> Jerry is a minister, and he knows how to do these things, you know. <laughs> Me, I'm just kind of blunt. <laughs> uh, Kathy Kendall ha asked the question of Jerry, did you have direct interaction with the, uh, the Fire Department of New York and the New York, New York Police Department? I did have some conversations with, with some of them and some of our folks that had gone there. I was really struck by the... Uh, the Irish influence on safety forces there in New York. All of, it seemed to me like all of the firefighters had an Irish heritage and it was strong and, and, and their fathers and their grandfathers were, were firefighters or police officers. Um, and uh, I was amazed at that. I had never known that. And how they were all pulling together. Everybody was brothers up there, brothers and sisters together in common cause, and, and I was very, uh, all of that really made me so proud to be an American, because they were. they were. They were proud that we're not gonna let this awful thing define us, uh, overtake us, uh, defeat us. We're gonna come back, and they have. The same thing with the Newfoundlanders. They're, most of the people from Newfoundland but they came from Ireland. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, uh, Ireland is uh, is closest to to um, to Newfoundland than what you know most of the United States is. That's awesome. Interesting too, uh, to pick up on what Shirley and Jerry both said. Um, I also got to go back to the Pentagon um, on the one year anniversary in two thousand two, and the most of the the, the structural work. To, to repair and rebuild the Pentagon was done in 11 months. It was finished by mid-August. And George W. Bush went to the lectern that day and said, this great building in less than a year has been made whole again. Mm -hmm. Again, there's just those moments in time that, um, that are indelible. So Kathy Fox asks, what do each of the panelists think Americans can and should do to regain the unifying spirit we had 20 years ago, and we've lost it. I'll, I'll say that we need to sh love our fellow man. We need to be kind to one another. We don't know the, the problems that other people are having, and it's very easy just to give somebody a smile. 
uh, you know, or a pat on the back or anything else. Just be kind to other people. And don't have this road rage, don't have, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm really fearful about what's going on in my country. Um, and sometimes I think I've just gotten too old, you know, but no, I love my country. I, when I go back to Newfoundland, you know, of course they fly the flags and the flags are at half staff. They always have, and when I go back to the school, they always have the American flag at the top. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Canadian and the Newfoundland flags are below. And I'm thinking, that's, you know, I don't know about that, but. <laughs> I would, well, let's go back again. It's, it's been 20 years. So think about, you know, there was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. There was no TikTok. And there was this little fledgling company that turned a profit for the first time in Q4 2001. This little company called Amazon. <laughs> so think about what's happened 20 years since. I don't know if this will get cheers or if you guys will throw food at me, but I almost wish 20 years later, I, I wish we could go back to <laughs> no social media in the sense of um, the, nastiness. the nastiness. And you know what? The, the discord, God forbid, if something on any kind of a scale of 9-11 were to happen now, what, what some of the channels, in, uh, uh, some channels of social media would, would bring to the conversation would just be infuriating. So uh, there was something um, about reporting back then that um, people came to their newspaper, people came to their TV screens, radio speakers, whatever it may be, and they came for knowledge and to Jerry's point, they came to unify. They did. Yeah. I, I, uh, w when I think about the way we were 20 years ago as opposed to now, back then we had never gone through anything like that. I mean, Pearl Harbor, was that was in the 40s, right? Uh, nothing like that had ever uh, happened in our country. We were galvanized by this, this tragedy, this catastrophe that had overwhelmed us and, and had affected every part of our, our country. And we were a bright, shining star at that moment as a country coming together and doing so many great things. Some of it was a little crass, I will say. Uh, capitalism got into that. If you remember, uh, a lot of car dealers were, were uh, keeping America strong. We're going to give you 20% off on an automobile. Uh, there. Uh, a Walmart store that had twin towers of Coke cans and all sorts of things of that nature uh, were happening as well. But the indomitable human spirit was really on display in that time. And I think even today, when we see the tragedy you see, in, in the South with the flooding and, and, and the wildfires out west, there are some helping hands, uh, but those are kind of localized, sort of isolated areas. Uh, this was a big deal that everybody uh, had some buy-in on that we were brought together on. I hope that we, going forward, can teach our children and, and learn some lessons from uh, this 20th anniversary of, of September 11th on how to be a better America, how to be better people, how to love uh, better. Uh, my hope springs eternal on that. Yes, your question. Yeah, Marian Harris. One of the images that I can never get out of my head is the, um, the, all the walls with the pictures of loved ones, if you see so-and-so, if you see so-and-so. And when did it dawn on you that they were never going to see those people again because they were gone? Um, I, I mean, that must have been, it was really difficult for me. Uh, and I can't imagine what it was like being there and realizing that all those, I just see walls and walls of, of pictures of people who were missing. Yes, and, and people hoping against hope that their loved one was in some sort of hovel in, in the debris that would come out. And it, it, it was just a long, long time um, dealing with that. Uh, it, 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 it was very hard. When I came home, I found myself crying uh, spontaneously for no apparent reason. Did you feel that too, Scott? Sure. Yeah, for sure. Shirley? 
You know, uh, another really very touching experience, one of the, one of the uh, passengers on my plane was a woman from Palm Beach, Florida. Her daughter and son-in-law and their family lived in New York City. She wasn't able to reach them, obviously, from the plane. And even when she got into Lewisport, <clears throat> she was assigned to one of the little churches as well. Um, she, as soon as she got off the plane, she talked with the mayor and said, please, 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 can you find my, can you find my, my uh, family? He finally was able to determine that, yes, they had, the, the, the son-in-law was a photographer, a professional photographer. He was working right in the area where the, the, the buildings went down. Um, and they did find him. They did find him later. They found his, his entire body. They were able to um, develop the pho photographs and so forth. She said to me later when I met her, she said, Shirley, I'm Jewish. Now, the church she stayed in was not Jewish, obviously, but the, she said, I never realized that someone of a different faith could comfort me the way he did. And, you know, it was really, it was really touching. So many wonderful, touching men of memory. So many, Thank so many. Thank you so much. I, I talk too much, but no, no, no. a lot you, of you're, things. <laughs> you're spellbinding. We'd love to hear more from you, but we just are Don't out of time, time now. <laughs> We're going to turn the program back over to Kelly Atkinson for some concluding, concluding remarks. Well, I hope you found today's forum as inspiring as I did. Um, I also want to remind everyone about Come From Away, February 8th through 13th at the Ohio Theater, so you can get your tickets starting November 4th. Don't forget, I'm sure we all want to hear more. I know I do. Um, and please make plans now to join us next Wednesday as CMC explores the Link Us Columbus Mobility Initiative with our special guest, Columbus Mayor Andrew J. Ginther, and a panel of experts. Our thanks to today's forum sponsor, the Columbus Foundation, and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. And thank you to our online virtual seat patrons once again. And our special appreciation and thanks to our speakers, Shirley Brooks-Jones, Scott Light, our special guest, Joe Comartin, and our host, Jerry Revish. Thank you all for joining us. Oh yeah, we can talk to them. <laughs> And I also just want to thank all of you for joining us. We truly could not do this without you. And we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Thanks. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.